Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 30 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me as always is my partner in this endeavor, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, Zaki. Uh, how are you doing? It's been a while. I um, feel like it's been longer than it probably has, but uh, it's good to be back and uh, good to be talking to you again. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, from the last time that we talked until now, obviously uh, the the world has has moved on, and there have been uh, many uh, global events that have uh, sort of bumped up against things that we discuss on this show anyway. And specifically, I'm talking, of course, about uh, the terror attacks in Beirut in Paris that have once again put the question of what Islam is and what it represents uh, in as as part of the global conversation and uh and in that sense obviously that the, that question of of what role islam plays what role muslims play in in this conversation is something that uh, obviously this show is all about and so the timing of our next guest could not be better and I want to make sure that uh, we throw to him as soon as possible. Our guest for this episode is Dr. Joseph Lombard, who is currently a professor at the American University of Sharjah in the Department of Arabic and Translation Studies. He is a translator, commentary author, and general story editor, general editor, excuse me, for the Study Quran. He is also a former advisor for interfaith affairs to King Abdullah II of Jordan and the author, editor, and translator of several articles and books on topics of Islamic philosophy, Sufism, and Quranic studies. He is a frequent lecturer and has taken part in several interfaith dialogues, among them the Common Word Initiative, and he is here to talk to us about the study Quran, which uh, emerges in, at a time when I think its necessity is most acute. Dr. Lombard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Zaki, for having me. It's an honor to be here. And so, so just obviously, I, I, I don't want to bury the lead here. Tell us about the study Quran and why this uh, this publication is unique and uh, necessary in, today, in this conversation. Well, the study Quran is a new volume, just came out about a week ago, actually, that has uh, a new translation of the Quran, and a running commentary for every verse of the Quran, and 15 essays from leading scholars around the world. What really makes this particular translation different than others is two things. One, it is a translation done by an academic committee. This is a big problem that we have with the history of Quran translation, particularly into English, is that almost every single translation is done by an individual author. I don't mean to denigrate them in any way. They've done incredible things uh, in their translations. But whenever you have a single author, you can have predilections and personal uh, perspectives that run into it. Whereas when you have an academic team, people can really call each other on things and you end up with a better product at the end, I believe. Um, the other thing that really distinguishes this, and this is what makes it unique, is the running commentary in English. One person said that this is the first commentary on the Quran in the English language. Um, and that I don't think that's entirely correct, but it's the first one that is widely available uh, in this manner. And, uh, and so one can really pick up in a single volume and gain access to not only what the Quran says, but also to the history of interpretation and how Muslims have worked with particular verses of the Quran. Hmm. Well, and, and and my understanding also is that the, the book, the Sunni perspective and the Shia perspective. Oh, it's got it's got not just the Sunni perspective, but multiple Sunni perspectives. Uh, you'll find if you go through the right, history of right. Sunni tafsir that a lot of positions that we tend to identify with Sunni Islam were somewhat different uh, in their earlier iterations. But yes, we allow for Shiite interpretations and for Sufi interpretations uh, to come into uh, the commentary as well. There are certain verses of the Quran where you're going to find that Sufi commentators uh, talk more about, shall we say, aspects of tarbiyah or spiritual practice uh, than do others. And so those are some of the better commentaries to go to to talk, talk about those verses. Now, did, what was the sort of genesis of the project like you? I mean, I know you sort of identified uh, some of the uh, limitations of perhaps some of the other translations that are out there in the English language. Um, was that really the impetus to 
uh, to begin the you know to begin the project. Well, when we began, the impetus was to write a commentary in English, was to write a study Quran that people can have access to and pick up in one volume and really study the text. Um, however, we we thought we were going to do one of the existing translations. And we went through all of the existing translations, and we really found that none of them was accurate and consistent enough to be the basis for a study Quran. And we have Muslims all over who sit in halaqas and study the Quran in translation. But a lot of those translations are quite inconsistent. Uh, so this really, we wanted something more consistent that is really much true to the Arabic. Another thing you find in a lot of translation, so be surprised how often the translation is actually what the commentary says and not what the Arabic says. Mm. And so we tried very hard and we even caught ourselves in several instances. We said, wait a minute. After years, we said, oh, wait a minute. We translated that according to the common interpretation, not to exactly what the Arabic says. So we really wanted to ground that. And that's something that I think uh, does stand out in this project. And, and I mean, can you talk about the sort of the necessity of this, especially now, right? I mean, we, we live in an age of, of, and I know I'm not the only person to have used this term, but, but uh, Islam-splaining, where you have uh, people with an active anti-Islam agenda who will be in the faces of people who are Muslim or are sympathetic to Muslim and say, well, have you read Surah this and, you know, this verse, you know, and they speak with this air of, of authority because, you know, uh, many people, many Muslims, in fact, don't necessarily know chapter and verse. And so there is this tendency to sort of take a verse out of context and spin it in any which way. So it feels like the arrival of this book at this moment could, is, is very opportune. I think that it's, it's something that actually we've needed for a long time. And, uh, and if, if this had come out five years ago, there probably would have been an event close to that that we all would have said, oh, it's a good thing this is here. If it had come out 10 years ago, we would have said, oh, it's a good thing that we've got this now. So uh, I think that that is, um, you know, it's just that the context in which we live, we've needed something like this for at least, you know, really 30 years. Um, and what we have done here really does help one to go in. And if somebody says, well, this verse says X, Y, Z, somebody can pick up this volume now and say, well, people also think it says ABC and they also think it says QRS and they also think it says another thing and another thing. And so you can go in and say that there's the whole broad range of how Muslims have encountered the text. Another fundamental thing, I think you're alluding to this, is those verses that people will often use uh, to blame Islam for being, quote, violent, unquote, and the big scary religion out there. And if you really look at this, verses like 9-5, the sword verse, uh, 47-4 that ISIS likes to quote a lot, and things like this, we explain the historical context of the verse and demonstrate the manner in which many commentators said, no, there are limitations on the particular application of this verse, and those limitations must be observed. And so mm -hmm. one knows that there's not a blanket opportunity to go out and act in accord with them according to one's whim or to the illness in one's heart. Right. And I think that I think that's a real service, not only to, uh, say, readers who are not familiar with the Quran or with Muslim tradition, and equally, or perhaps even greater so, to Muslims who are readers of, of, the, of the study Quran, because they uh, don't know the varying and uh, multiplicity of interpretations to any, any given verse, um, or something else that you just uh, uh, not alluded to, but, uh, but, but stated with regards to context. So we're talking about the basics of sort of hermeneutics and the basics of textual analysis, which as a scholar, you know, uh, as a lawyer, you know, when you're reading, uh, whether it's a statute or a text or, or a, a, the Constitution, right, it's it's all it's all the same. So um, certainly I, I think, that, yeah, I, I think that's it's, 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 it's again, an excellent, excellent uh, contribution. Thank you.
Um, and, you know, I, I think something that you mentioned uh, moments ago with regards to certain events, like had this book come out five years ago, there would have been probably something else, you know, that was in the news media uh, where people could say, well, this is such an opportune time. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I know you and I started corresponding before the events of, uh, of Paris. So and here we are, you know, speaking in the context of, of, of that tragedy. Um but to go back to probably one of the sort of more singular events um, in the last 20 years, you know, 9-11, September the 11th and the attacks in New York City and D.C., um, you know, would, would, would this book have, have, have been written or this endeavor initiated had it not been for the events of 9-11? Yes, it would have been written if it hadn't been for those events. The Basically, the academic track was, in a sense, moving towards this. Right. And I believe that HarperCollins had actually had the idea before that. So it's not just a response to that. But another question we need to ask ourselves is, would 9-11 have happened if this book and others like it had been written? And I think that's the more important question, because what we have with the phenomena of terrorism, of Al-Qaeda, of Daesh, ISIS, call them what you will. What we have with all of these is ignorance and people who are trying to proof text from the Quran to promote particular political ideologies. The more knowledge that is out there in our community, the less opportunity there is for people to do that. So if we have this process in place of making sure that there is wide access to the full depth and breadth of the Islamic tradition, then a lot of these young people who might buy into some of these ideologies will already be inoculated against it. You fight terrorism with knowledge. Hmm. That's right. And I think that's, yeah, I mean, you very... Uh, uh, eloquently sort of uh, articulated what I was trying to say, which is the idea that, yeah, through Muslim literacy, you know, uh, not only among, uh, like, again, Muslim literacy among, the, like, the Muslim populi- uh, populi- uh, population, but also with regards to non-Muslims who engage the text or want to know something more about Islam, it is so needed with regards to just basic literacy about what the Quran says, what the Quran is, right? So I think that, again, where the study of Quran really kind of fits in with that. Um, um, I'm a little remiss in that um, my uh, – so I I, tech, I, I I had ordered – I had pre-ordered my copy. Unfortunately, Harper, Harper Collins is telling me that I'm my my, uh, my copy is slated for delivery tomorrow. This is by 24 hours. Uh, I wanted to at least have delved into it a little bit. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about – um, cause I know, and I, I asked this question selfishly because one of my heroes is, uh, among that scholarly panel, um, besides you, Dr. Lombard, um, <laughs> I don't need to be anybody's hero. <laughs> <laughs> one of my sort of, well, yeah, one of my sort of, uh, academic mentors as it were. Um, but, um, some of the other people that were involved in the project, and if you could maybe even highlight some of the other authors that you said who wrote texts or wrote essays, uh, that are featured. Yeah. I mean, Sayyid Hussein Nasser was the editor in chief. He's the uh, one. He, yeah. yeah. He wrote, he wrote the, uh, he wrote the introduction. Right. He didn't write, he didn't write the commentary. The commentary was written by all of the general editors, but I don't want to downplay his hand at all. He edited everything. Sometimes you have an editor in chief who almost does things in name and other people do things. Dr. Nasser at his age, I mean, he read every single word of this text at least twice. Um, He was an incredibly assiduous uh, editor. Now, the other thing that you're mentioning is the essays. I think the essays are really important because you have people from all swaths of uh, of Islam in there. You have, for example, Ingrid Mattson wrote the essay on how to read the Quran. And in fact, for people who have no experience of the Quran, I tell them that's where you start with this book. Go to Ingrid Mattson's essay. And it's an excellent essay. It really goes into how one should approach the Quran. Uh, And I think some Muslims might find it helpful as well. Uh, Hamza Yusuf, the last essay, Death, Dying, and the Afterlife in the Quran. It's a beautiful essay. And it really shows how many aspects, really the theme of death, dying, and the afterlife permeates the Quran. Because one could almost sum up the Quran in one way to say, It's this message that, look, the only thing that's guaranteed to you 
is God, the present moment, and death. Mm -hmm. And if you want it all to work out, focus on God now and prepare for death. Mm -hmm. It's all right here, right now. And in a sense, many surahs that we recite commonly in the Quran, such as Surah Al-Wathal, are really meditations on death to help us prepare for it. And Hamza Yusuf brings that out extremely effectively. Now, we also have the, uh, the essay on the Quran and Islamic law was done by Ahmad Tayyib, who is uh, the, the, uh, the Sheikh Al-Azhar. Ayatollah Muhaqqiq al-Bamad did the essay on Islamic theology and philosophy and the Quran. And he's considered by many people to be one of the leading intellectuals uh, in Iran today. Uh, so this gives an idea of, of all of these different people. And then there are also people like Walid, uh, Walid Saleh, who's at the University of Toronto, who's considered by many people to be one of the world's leading experts in Quran commentary, wrote our essay on Quran commentary. And, uh, and Muzaffar Iqbal wrote an essay on the, uh, on the Quran and, uh, and science and scientific tafsir. So this gives you an idea of, of the way that we tried to really cast a broad net to bring in the whole of the Islamic tradition, not only in terms of the interpretive tradition, but also in terms of the different uh, views that you have of Islam today. That's right. That's right. And um, uh, I wasn't just being facetious when I said, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I've, I've looked at your own sort of career and, 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 and your past and some of the, the past scholarly work that you've done. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit also, you know, about uh, your sort of journey, not only your journey to Islam and your relationship with the with, with the faith, but also maybe starting off with uh, uh, kind of like where you're from originally and, and, and how you came into the faith and, and what drove you or what was the impetus there to study Islam academically and, and where you are now in terms of your career, your academic career. Yeah, no, that's that's. Uh, I answer that question just about differently every time somebody asks it of me, because it really does involve reflecting deeply on things that have shaped one's life. And they, they tend to look different through the prism of, of the present day. But uh, I came to Islam uh, through really through uh, studying um, with uh, with, say, to say, Nasser. I was uh, I was an undergraduate at the George Washington University. And I walked into his class on religion and science. Um, and I mean, within two weeks, I was just like, wow, this yeah. guy has just shattered my paradigm. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I went on and I kept studying and I found it just, I mean, just fascinating, this broad swath. And this is nothing about Islam in particular. I actually started looking for a kind of a way to turn back to Christianity Mm -hmm. um, and be a better Christian before I embraced Islam. And it was my process of trying to be a better Christian that led me uh, to Islam. I, th I went through, I was going to priests of all different denominations and talking to them about, about various things. And, uh, and, and I just found that one of the problems I had was that I was developing uh, this love for the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the more and more I read about him, the more and more I realized that everything I had ever wanted uh, as a as a Christian was found in uh, in his sunnah and and his adab. And I really, uh, in a sense, while it was through the classes of Dr. Nasser that I was I was introduced to Islam, it was through developing this love for uh, the fullness of of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, that I that I came. Uh, to Islam and uh, and embraced it. Now, then you asked about you know the other dimensions of how I, I became an academic. That was like no, no, but, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I, yeah. I don't mean to cut you off. I mean because I mean you, you've you've just mentioned some lovely, lovely things. Um, so when while you were an undergrad, were you were you sort of were you a religious studies major or were you just taking Dr. Nasser's course as an elective? I took Dr. Nasser's course because uh -huh. a friend of mine who was a senior. Okay. Uh, he said, uh, he said, my one regret is that I never took a course, a course with Sayyid Hussein Nasser. I've heard that he's the best lecturer in the university. And I said, okay, well, I'll take a class with him. And I don't want to miss the best lectures in the university. Wow. <laughs> so I, I went in and I stumbled in. I mean, I had like, you know, hair down to my shoulders, cut off jeans, a tie dye, you know, I was living that kind of life. And, uh, and, and I went in there and I was just, I mean, really, it just, it, it rocked my world. 
you know, yeah, and, and right. so that's why I started. And actually, I was an English lit major. And oh. I was interested in, I still love English literature, and it's one of my passions. But I, I went into that, and I started studying a lot more religion courses because of all of the religious themes within literature that in the modern context, a lot of people kind of pass over in different ways. Robert Frost, and, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Robert Frost, you know, I mean, J.M. Quetzi. It's like you, right. there are people who are even secularist writers yeah. who have religious themes that sometimes they're not aware of. Uh, right. And ways in which, you know, for example, the King James Bible has completely influenced the use of the English language on so many levels. Mm. So these are the types of things I was looking for. And so I really, and, and I was just taking these religious studies courses. And then I said, wait a minute. I just got to take a few more courses and I've got a major. Uh, so I decided to do, uh, to do a religious studies major. Okay. Uh, and then I stayed on and did a master's degree with Dr. Nasser just because, you know, studying with him was, was such a joy. Um, and I mean, the whole thing was so accidental because I only went to the George Washington university in the first place uh -huh. because my mother worked there as an administrator. And so it was free. Wow. So I could have gone to other places and I was just like, well, this is free. Why would I pay at another place <laughs> when I can get it for free here? <laughs> and, uh, and then it just all kind of, uh, fell into place. Are you originally, are you originally from like the East coast from the Virginia DC area? No, I am one of the few white people you will met who was born <laughs> and raised in Washington, DC. <laughs> <laughs> people forget. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That about Washington D.C. That other yep. than uh, other than the people in Congress, <laughs> mostly, yeah. right? It's, it's a it's a very yeah it's a very it's a very ethnic city yeah yes indeed uh, and very ethnically diverse. So um so I think Dr. Nasser was there starting what so we're talking in the eighties uh, is this is this the time period we're referring to? Yeah, for me this is actually I guess this was the 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 early nineties yeah early nineties okay okay. Uh, and so wonderful. So then you, you go on to your MA, uh, and then, um, did you have any stints abroad during that time or were you? Yeah, I spent some time in Morocco. Um, okay. and then, I mean, during the whole course of my, of my studies now, I've lived in Morocco, Yemen, Iran, Egypt, Jordan, um, and now the United Arab Emirates. All right. Um, so those are all the places I've lived. I've visited a few more, but yeah, those are all the places that I've lived and and studied with uh, with various figures. Uh, yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. Now, now, now you mentioned or you you, you talked about Sheikh Hamza as being one of the contributors. Um, obviously, someone local to us here in the Bay Area for Zaki and I. Um, in fact, one of the times I did meet, say, Doc, you know, Professor Nasser was when he gave the uh, when he gave the keynote, uh, or he was one of the keynote speakers at Zaytuna College's first. Uh, first uh, uh, graduation ceremony uh -huh. uh, and that was wonderful and one of my sort of one of my cherished memories is taking this dog-eared beat-up copy of ideals and realities <laughs> uh, a book yep. that that, that a uh, classic yeah, yeah. A classic and a book that changed my life as an undergrad um having read that um a beat-up dog-eared copy to Dr. Nuster and I said, "Look, I know this. It's just that this copy means so much to me, and this book means so much." Allah. <laughs> among so many other things, could you please sign it? And so, yeah, a, a very cherished memory and a cherished, uh, uh, yeah, a gift that I that, that I have. So, um, yeah, no. What I wanted to ask was like, so now in the course of your studies, I mean, is this where you sort of encounter and and sort of even befriend people like Sheikh Hamza and others, uh, Imam Zaid, Shaka, people you know who we had, who we have had on the show, other academics, perhaps like Dr. Sherman Jackson. Oh yeah. In the course of my studies, you know, it's been, I mean, this has been one of the great honors is, is to be able to work, you know, with people like Sheikh Hamza. I worked on the book submission, faith and beauty, the right. religion of Islam with, uh, with Sheikh Hamza and with, uh, with Imam Zaid, you know, it was great. I mean, I, I, I kind of penned the first draft and they went through and they edited some things. They made some great suggestions, you know, throw in like, like there's some other hadith that would be more appropriate here. Oh, this is an odd translation of this, you know, verse and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe this is a little bit too abstruse for, you know, your general audience to get. It was great to work with them. And I was, I was really deeply honored, you know, to work with, uh, with Zaytuna. Uh, on that on that book, and, and in fact, I think that that book is is um, really an, an important book. And that you know, I don't want to take all the credit for that because that was actually Sheikh Hamza's vision. That mm. particular book was a, a a shorter book, kind of like the uh, the book, The Vision of Islam, 
by uh, Chidik and Murata, and he wanted to do a kind of a, a molachas, you might say, a summary yeah. of that. And I said, well, you know, if you want to do it and you want to make it that short, you really need to write a whole new book that follows the same format. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we did. But the one thing that we did, and this again, and I'm really grateful to Sheikh Hamza for this, is that he really made me see how the last part of that hadith pertains to the first, shall we say, three parts that go to uh, Islam, Iman, Ihsan. And it's like the, the hadith of Gabriel. Exactly, the hadith of right. Gabriel, right. you know, where it talks about the end of times and the sign of the end of times. Because then you see that what that's saying is that at the end of times is when Iman, Islam, and Ihsan are all out of balance with one mm. another. And you've got wow. some people who are claiming, I can do Islam without Ihsan. You know? And then the, the law just becomes a dead letter. People who are claiming, I can do Iman without, you know, without, uh, without Ihsan or Islam, meaning I don't have to submit. I can just kind of go with some kind of creedal ideas that come from my own mind. Right. And people who want to do, do Ihsan without Islam. And then that's when you get into kind of pseudo-Sufism and things along these lines. And so you really see that that end of the hadith is really emphasizing the fundamental importance of focusing on all dimensions mm -hmm. of what precedes it within that hadith. And that was a beautiful thing that, you know, uh, uh, Murata and Chittik, for all the wonderful things that they did in their book, they didn't fully bring out, but, but, uh, but Sheikh Hamza had, had that observation. And so we were able to bring it out on, on that book. And, you know, I love Sheikh Hamza. I love Zaid Shaker. Uh, they are uh, two people who, you know, when things go back in time, um, people will look. And I mean, these men have, have they have literally risked their lives, uh, not just for Islam, but for humanity. That's right. Wow. That's right. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, what do you say that? Um, but uh, just for the, you know, I, I wanted to make a couple of points of clarity just for some of our listeners uh, who may not be familiar. Um, so the hadith that we've been sort of talking about is, known as the Hadith of Gabriel, and it, as the name implies, it, it, it's a uh, prophetic tradition in which Gabriel comes in the form of a man and, and basically engages in a dialogue with the, with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and asks him a series of questions, and four in particular. Um, first being, what is Islam, you know, i.e., what is Islam, uh, you know, translated as submission or the faith of Islam. What is Iman, uh, meaning belief? And then what is Ihsan or spiritual excellence? And then he asks about the end times. And that's sort of the, uh, and, and, and often this hadith known as, again, the hadith of Gabriel is seen as the uh, starting point, if you will, for teaching students about the various dimensions of Islam and faith and spiritual excellence and so on. Um, I hope I've done an adequate job, Professor Lombard. And what we can do here, you've done a very good job. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of things for our listeners. So, so, so anyway, so now, now here, here you are, um, you know, and, uh, and you're, you're now a, a professor uh, in charge uh, at the, in the AU system. Um, and uh, what, what are some of the areas that you tend to focus on? I know you, Zaki, in the, in, in the intro mentioned Sufism and, and, and certainly translations. You work in the Department of Translations. Um, but uh, what are some of your areas of focus in terms of uh, study and, and writing and research? Well, you know, it's interesting. You, you mentioned Sufism, uh, and uh, this is one of the things that, I've, that I have focused on uh, extensively in my research and Sufism from all dimensions. And one of the things I would say that I have realized, the more that I have invested in Sufism uh, and the more I've investigated it, and it's been part of my, you might say, journey towards being more focused on Quranic studies, is that true Sufism is bringing out the inherent tarbiyya or training of the soul that is within the Qur'an. Because ultimately the soul, the, the Qur'an, what it wants you to do is to train your soul for the meeting with God. Mm -hmm. And Sufism is about this process. There are a lot of speculative teachings I wouldn't say speculative, people call them speculative, but shall we say cosmological teachings that derive from the insights that many Sufis obtain as you might say the soul becomes closer to the unseen realm 
uh, and uh, and closer to the divine presence. But that's not the heart of Sufism. Those, in a sense, can even be be uh, visions that sometimes, as uh, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali puts it very well, he says, these are the things that don't need to be written about because for those who can understand them, they don't need to read about them. And for those who can't understand them, they might trip them up on the path. Mm. Uh, but ultimately, Sufism is really, uh, it's about that training. And those insights, they can help a lot of people of different dispositions along the way. But as a result, I've become more and more grounded in uh, in Quranic studies as I've gone along. And the study Quran uh, came about. And, you know, since this is uh, more of a personal format, I mean, I've, I've been hesitant to kind of say this when we talk about this, but... Uh, I had a lot of dreams over the years about the Quran in different ways. And they're the type of dreams that you wake up from. You wake up for Fajr when you have these dreams, which they say is one of the mark of a veridical dream. And then wow. when Dr. Nasser, the moment that Dr. Nasser said to me, I, uh, you know, I've been invited to do this project. And I remember it so well. This was like almost 10 years ago. We were having uh, uh, lunch at a restaurant, and my wife was there, and my, my, uh, my first daughter is just a baby. Um, and he said, I've been invited to do this project, and the first person that I thought of was you. And it was like, bam, all of a sudden, these things that have been happening for like 10 plus years, they all of a sudden flushed together. And I was like, whoa, that's what all of this was about. Right. And as I mean, this is one of those things that happens and you just you just know. It's like, you know, some people talk about when they meet their spouse, it's mm-hmm. like they just know. And, uh, <laughs> and this for me was it was like I just knew this was the thing that for better or for worse, this was what I was supposed to do. Right. Uh, and so and, and so, you know, we went and and invested ourselves uh, uh, full bore. And I, quite honestly, mm-hmm. I never could have imagined being this deeply invested uh, in an academic project. It was, it was much more than an academic project. And um, it was, I mean, really an honor to be involved in it. And as, as Janir Dale, who's uh, one of the other editors, he said, he said, we'll never do something like this again in our lives. You wow. know, we'll never, we'll never be involved in a, in a project like this. I mean, think about it. Even Dr. Nasser, with everything that he has done, I mean, this man has done more for the presentation of Islam in the West than just about anybody else. Anybody who's writing about Islam in English, even if they don't like Dr. Nasser, they're still using the vocabulary that he forged. That's right. I mean, he's the one who gave us the vocabulary for discussing Islam in all of its breadth within the English language. Um, and he has said that this is the most important project of his career. Wow. With and everything that, that he's done for 50 years. Right. The, the numerous, numerous dozens of books he's written. So for him to say something like that, yeah, and, and just being a giant in the field, like you said, and and, and you know his name for for those who've listened to the show, his name is is one that we have brought up in the past. Whether it's been with conversations with the Dr. Jackson, in fact, Dr. Jackson, one of the memories he recalled was sitting in on a course with the, Dr. Nestor. I think Dr. Nestor at the time was at Temple. Maybe or yeah, yeah, that's or, right. Dr. Nasser was at Temple for a little while. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so Dr. Jackson sits in on a class that, as an undergrad with Professor Nasser and just describes sort of just again meeting this sort of intellectual giant, you know. And uh, I know we've also in conversations we've had with Dr. Munir Farid when we were talking about just you know you, when you talk about the academic study of Islam in America, I mean he remains uh, a giant in the field, and that's Dr. Nasser, and who has just made an indelible contribution to the field. Um, but um, I wanted to go back, Professor Lombard, um, to the conversation we were having about Sufism, because I think that, I mean, I mean, you know, I don't think you've, you've been unabashed in terms of your embrace of that tradition and the fact that you belong to that tradition and how much that tradition, the Sufi tradition has meant to you. But I mean, you know, obviously it goes without saying that this also happens to be an aspect of Islam that is, um, that is unfortunately maligned, and uh, one could almost, I would argue, one could trace the, the, you know, the uh, maligning of Sufism and the, der- you know, and the uh, derogation of, of, of the Sawwuf and, and the Sufi tradition to the rise of the kind of uh, scriptural literalism and violence that we see in the world. Uh, but I, I, I'd love for you to sort of comment on that and how you see 
that correlation and if you were, were to agree with that assessment that I just made. Well, I wrote a book about it. Um, right. <laughs> so I agree about it. I agree with it. I'm asking the right person. There you go. Yeah. 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 No, the um, book I edited, it's a collection of essays, um, uh, Islam, Fundamentalism, and the Betrayal of Tradition. That's exactly the the, the, the kind of driving thesis of that book. And right. you know, I'm not going to say it's only the, 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 the denigration of Sufism. I mean, it's also people who don't want traditional Kalam. Uh, to be uh, something to which people will turn in the modern yeah. world and also people who want to violate how the Sharia uh, actually works and how fiqh actually works and what are the principles um, for issuing a fatwa and things along these lines. So all of it has been uh, has been kind of thrown out of balance. But I do think that you're right, that one of the main traits that we see with all of these uh, strident puritanical groups is an effort uh, to denigrate and marginalize Sufism. Mm -hmm. Sufism, like any human phenomena, has had its excesses at different times. But that's not Sufism, that's human beings. That's human right. beings do wacky things. It's part of the enigma of our condition. Um, but you look at, what, at how integral this tradition has been uh, over time, and you realize that without their being, something in place to emphasize the sciences of the soul and the science of spiritual purification and spiritual attainment, there's no Islam. It all has to be there. You need to have that in place. You need to have the law in place. You need to have theology in place. It's all part of a greater civilization. And why is it that when you go through and you look at the places where these strident puritanical groups go, some of the first things that they try to do is tear apart any Sufi shrines that are there, any madrasas that are associated with Sufism. That's their first target. They know, on some level, they know that this is the greatest check against their spread within the Islamic world. And this is something that we, as Muslims, it's our responsibility to go back and embrace this and look at this. I mean, look, look throughout the Islamic world. What's the most widely read treatise in the entire Islamic world? The Burda of Imam al-Busiri. That's got some pretty heavy-duty Sufi lines in it. Um, and really it is. I mean, he was in a Sufi order. He was influenced by Sufism. And when you go and you look at mosques around the world, they've got Quran written in lines from the Burda. And then look at the, at the you know, the Hizb al-Bahr of Imam Abul Hassan al-Shazadi. This is recited all over the world. I mean, these things are part of our tradition. That's to try right. and go and say that we can continue to have an Islamic civilization without having aspects of Sufism present within it is to really say that I don't want an Islamic civilization. I want a modern civilization of my imagining unto which I can add the name Islam. That is, yeah, yeah, so true, so true. I mean, and I think that any objective reading of Muslim tradition, uh, other than perhaps a few outliers, uh, would render that conclusion that if you were to if you were to walk into perhaps any Muslim capital in the you know in, in the sort of quote unquote golden era let's say you know the 11th 12th century um, of the common era and ask a common layman even um, if you were to ask them what school they belong to what school of jurisprudence they would have an answer what school of theology they belong to kalam as you mentioned they would have yeah. an answer and what Sufi tariqah they belong to they would have an yeah. answer. <laughs> that was that. That's how people identified themselves. Uh, meaning, in terms of religious, uh, you know, religious uh, within the religious paradigm. So, Indeed. yeah. Any any objective reading. So, yeah. Thank you for saying that too, though. Um, but um, uh, I'd like to maybe kind of also come back to a question that I wanted to ask with regards to the translation. Um, and again, brings us back to some of the things that you mentioned at the very outset of, of the. Of our conversation, um, which was some of the limitations in the other uh, translations that you found. Um, one of the limitations that I find, at least as a reader, um, of those translations, it has is, is the is the um, at times uh, antiquated uh, or not at times antiquated and at times cryptic language used. So certainly the old old Queen's English. Was there a conscious effort to write, to 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 issue this translation in a language? that was more um, 
you know, uh, I, I guess friendly for Western ear, modern Western ears? Uh, actually, we took almost the opposite course, which okay. is to make this move just to, to, we don't, shall we say, fully go into the King's English. You right. know, we're not going to say, wherefore, right. wherefore art thou means why are you, for example. Right. You know, if that phrase occurs in the ground, we're not going to say, wherefore art thou, X, Y, Z. And also, you know, ending in the, the third person um, uh, you know, uh, singular ending, uh, for the verb of F, you know, that's not something that we use. We do, however, use the, uh, the second person singular, the, thine, thou, uh, especially because there are places where the Quran, especially when it's, it's, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the prophet mm -hmm. when he uses the, and then he switches all of a sudden to be addressing the community. And so we then use you for the plural. To make that distinction that, okay, okay, there's a sun shift here. And also, when you say thee and thine for the current reader, it expresses something of nobility in that's the right. language. The Even though that's not how it was classically used, right. it's still, in the, in the modern context, it expresses something of majesty. Mm -hmm. There are also words like, you know, not, which means nothing, and, and or ought, which means something. So there are also words like that that have this resonance. Mm. Now, if you go through and you talk to people about you know, what they really associate the language of Scripture with, just ask them, and I've asked a whole lot of people over right. the past 10 years, they'll usually say the King James or right. they'll say Shakespeare. That's about 85% of the time. So and true. if you look at studies, it shows that uh, that – of the people who read the Bible regularly, more than 40% read the King James regularly. The next most widely read at 19% is the NIV translation. Yeah. So if you want to hit that register um, within, the, uh, within the modern context and people say, okay, sit up and listen, yeah. that's closer to it. Another thing is if you find a person who's never read the Quran and speaks modern Fusha, perfectly modern standard Arabic. Mm -hmm. They'll have problems with the Quran. The Quran is not a text in modern Arabic. That's right. And there's something that, you know, it's just it, the Quran is a book that says, be quiet, sit still, listen to me. And there's something about that more classical style of English, the King's English, mm -hmm. um, that says that same thing to people. If people don't want to sit down and listen to the text and they want it in, you know, modern English, and people, it's been, studies have shown that, for example, the New York Times is basically at an eighth grade level of English. If that's what people want, go to another translation. There's lots of other translations out there. That's going to exist. The current idiom is always going to change. If you want something that is going to last, you should not translate into the current idiom. And that is something that we wanted to affect with this particular translation. Something that, that we should you know, talk about in this context yeah. is that uh, we're at a really interesting point right now in Islamic history. There have been two major international languages of Islamic discourse, okay. Arabic and Persian. You know, even with the wide influence of the Ottoman Empire, Muslim intellectuals in lands that were controlled by the Ottomans, they weren't writing in Turkish. That's right. They were still writing in Arabic for the most part. Mm -hmm. Now, however, when you go into India, you know, Muslim intellectuals there, they were writing in Persian Farsi. and Arabic, but in, in Persian. And uh, never say Farsi to Dr. Nasser. In uh, <laughs> in English, yeah, because it's like saying Deutsch when you're yeah, speaking right. English. I'll get into that in a minute. But anyways, so in Persian, so these two languages have had this wide-ranging influence on Islamic intellectual discourse. We're now at the point where due to the interesting paradoxes of colonialism, English is becoming the third major language of international Islamic discourse. And we, therefore, really need uh, translations of materials that will stand the test of time, um, not only of the, of the Quran, but of other, uh, of other uh, texts. 
And, uh, and so I think that this particular translation comes at an important time, and we hope that it will have a longevity. We do not in any way claim that this is going to be, quote, the standard translation uh, of the Quran. In fact, the publisher wanted to call it that. And we said, no, you can't call it the standard. We're not going to make a claim like that. Wow. <laughs> but, but we do hope that, uh, that it will have longevity. Right. If I could, just again, you know, uh, this may seem counter, sort of a counterintuitive question just because um, we are talking about a translation that has just released. But uh, prior to, say, this translation, um, what translation were you recommending to people when they asked you for a, for a readable or a, um, you know, a, a, good, a good translation in, in, in English? I was actually, uh, I always recommend to people that they get at least two translations, if right. not three. Mm -hmm. um, and the ones that I highly recommend are uh, the ones of Arbery, because yeah. I think that Arbery is, is the best in terms of transmitting the, the august nobility of yeah. Quranic Arabic. I still think that he probably was closer to that than any other translator. Uh, and then... I say that the translation of the Ali Kuli Kara'i, I think, is uh, is particularly uh, accurate. Um, I don't always find it the most eloquent, personally, but it is consistent. Okay. And consistency has been a major problem in Quran translation. You'll find some translations out there that are widely read. You take the same passage, occurs five times, and it's translated completely differently in all instances. You can't see the relationship between these verses at all if you read it. I was just looking at another translation the other day. The word tathkira occurs three times in this passage. And in each instance, the word was translated differently. So you wouldn't have any idea that the passage was using the right. same word. Right, right. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, so those two in particular, yeah. Yes, those are the two two in particular. I actually started personally with uh, Muhammad Mar Marmaduke Pickthall. Yeah. Uh, I love it. I have a, it has a certain uh, place in my in my heart. I do find that it is quite inconsistent uh, mm -hmm. at times. Arbery is also inconsistent. There are places where Arbery kind of gets his accusatives mixed up at times. But you know, I mean, you can't. You know, but that's 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 a difficult thing in Arabic, and you can argue one way or the other at times. Um, but um, but still, it's it's you know the, these guys look without the efforts that they did, our project would have not been nearly as good. We're standing on on, on their shoulders. They paved the way uh, for this particular translation, and by no means do I think that anybody should go and just put those aside. Still, go look at them; they're beautiful. They've been a lot of benefit for a lot of people. Right. You know, I, I couldn't help but think when, when you were talking about sort of the uh, just the majesty and the augustness of, of, of say, the, you know, the old English um, in that context, thinking of uh, someone who speaks about that on or I've heard talk about that on, on another on a number of occasions. And that's Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah. Um, in fact, I, I would be remiss not to mention that this just this past weekend, I was talking to one of his very, very close students and. Um, apparently like one of, you know, one of the things that he has said recently is that he considers the study Quran to be one of the most important works in the English language, uh, in the last, you know, in the last few, few decades. So that's from Dr. Omar himself. So couldn't think of a better ringing endorsement, uh, professor Lombard. Uh, yeah, I actually, somebody sent me a copy of that, uh, of that. And I, I had to choke back tears. I yeah. mean, I have huh. such deep respect for uh, for Omar Farouk Abdullah. I mean, this is a man who is so deeply devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If only I could have an ounce of that devotion. Um, and uh, and if he, uh, for him to say something like that, um, yeah, I mean, that's enough, <laughs> quite frankly, you know, that, no, that, that's enough for me. <laughs> me. When I think of like people who are sagacious and just true sages in the truest sense of the word, I think of too, and that's Dr. Nasser and Dr. Say, you know, then Dr. Abdullah. So, yeah, that was. No, he, he really. I mean, he he has the the presence of of really the presence of the saints of old within him. Mashallah. Right, right, right. Um, so now I, I know we're we're just about out of time. You've got a hard stop coming up, uh, Professor Lombard. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, what, what's uh, what do you what, what are the next few couple of weeks or I guess the few weeks uh, and months look like in terms of uh, out there, you know, talking about the Quran? What do you have slated up for that? You know, in the well, I'm, I could go back to the United Arab Emirates <laughs> right now and teach my classes. Um, um, but um, <laughs> That's right. yeah, uh, we should point out that uh, Professor Lombard jo- joins us from D.C., right? Yeah, I'm in D.C. right now. We're actually going to do an event at Busboys and Poets. Um, uh, the idea is to is to start getting like uh, some discussions of this in what we might call, you know, a third space, um, because people in the mosque are going to are going to hear about it. But there there are you know a lot of people who need to be in these uh, in these third spaces where you want to have the, the comfort to really have uh, a good discussion. Um, about these things. And so that's what we're doing at Busboys and Poets uh, tonight. And I'm actually going to come back to the U.S., I think, in uh, in January uh, and do some talks. And of course, all the other editors are here um, and they're going to uh, and they're doing, uh, you know, and, and uh, there was something on there have been two things on CNN about it. NPR has done some right. some interviews. So I'm the, the word's getting out. But actually, you know, any listeners who are out there, if you don't have a copy and you want one, uh, it's going to be out of print. The first, the first print run sold out in the first week. Wow. Um, they, they don't have any more at Harper. Um, so they're already reprinting. Right. Um, uh, so if you want to get it any time in the next, uh, in the next uh, you know, week or so, you should get it now. Because <laughs> after the, the distributors run out of it, there's no more until probably sometime in January. I've been I've been jealous in the, in the in the nicest sense of that word when I've had so many friends of mine on Facebook just posting little selfies with their uh, <laughs> old, old copy and I just can't wait to touch and feel and hold my hard copy so I'm really looking forward to it tomorrow. Yeah. Um, uh, if I could, uh, so you, you mentioned coming back in January. We can talk offline about this, but and you also kind of talked about third spaces. Um, not that we necessarily use that term, but I. You know, come to the West Coast. We'd love to host you at Tatleef. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Tatleef, but uh, come and have a workshop on the study Quran right here. No, I'm I'm familiar with Tatleef, and I admi- admire uh, what you're doing. I think these are just the types of things that we, uh, uh, you know, we need to have all kinds of different places um, where we're. Uh, and this is one of the great ways that Islam gets integrated uh, into the community, and that there's a place where people feel comfortable. Uh, to be Muslim in all the multiple different ways that one is Muslim in the modern world. Uh, so I really do admire uh, what you guys are doing. And the West Coast is actually part of the trip. Uh, the plan is to fly all the way to the West Coast at the beginning uh, and then kind of make my way back to the East Coast and then go back to uh, to the UAE from there. Inshallah. Okay, well, then we'll yeah. definitely talk because, uh, yeah, we, we, we would love to make that happen. I imagine somewhere along the line you'll be stopping at Zaytuna. So uh, I'll, I'll steal you away from Berkeley, even though that's going to be tempting or, the, or difficult. <laughs> I bring you to Fremont here and here at Talif. So oh, it would be it would be an honor. You know, I just I, especially one of the really fun things about going out and uh, and introducing this project to people is to get to see these other communities, uh, you know, and, and I have a lot of these communities that I've never gone to. You know, one time I went and I spoke in Houston as part of a Zaytuna event. It was great. man. I mean, just to get to know that community and uh, to see many of the people, um, I, you know, I love doing that. It's 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 a lot of fun to go around and, and uh, see the different ways that different communities in the United States are expressing and living their Islam and the different solutions that they're coming to how to, you know, be able to manage uh, uh, living an Islamic life uh, in, uh, in the modern context. Uh, so it's one of the great and fun things about, about this project. I was born and raised there. It, it, it's, it's so ironic. It's so funny that you mentioned Houston. I don't know <laughs> of all the places you visited. You happen to mention Houston and that's where I'm from originally. So uh. fascinating. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like I was just in Atlanta and, you know, I mean, Atlanta is an amazing Muslim community. It's so diverse and it's so I mean, it's really so steeped uh, in, in history with the Wayfidi Muhammad community that was there and then all the other communities that have been growing up there. You know, it was and just like this is stuff that, frankly, you know, I'm just like I was just a scholar in my books and so I had no idea there were all these amazing people doing these amazing things. Uh, down in down in Atlanta, not just for the Muslim community, but actually, you know, I mean, the like the Islamic Speakers Bureau uh, down there, they are, you know, one of the biggest fundraisers for charity events in the whole of Atlanta. And it's like like second to Coca-Cola in some instances. And it's like they're just doing great things for the whole of not just the Muslim community, but of the uh, but uh, but of the greater community in their cities. And that's exactly what Muslims should be doing everywhere. Uh, it's a beautiful thing to see. 
Well, that's a perfect place to to leave off this conversation. And uh, you know, I I I think the the work that you've done on this on this text, I think it's it's extraordinary and it's extremely necessary. So I'm very grateful to have this as a resource to turn to uh, when I do find myself having you know some of those conversations that I alluded to at the top of our conversation. No, thank you. That's what I really hope that this book is going to do is to raise the literacy regarding the Quran to a new level, both within the Muslim community and with the overall uh, discussion of Islam. There's a whole new level of literacy to which everybody has to be accountable if they're going to go out and talk about this stuff in public. Well, perfect. And uh, with that, uh, thank you, Dr. Lombard, for joining us. It's been it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. So, thank you, Zaki, and thank you, Pavez. This has been wonderful. Oh, it's been an honor. Um, where can people find you online, Dr. Lombard? Um, you know, we often ask our guests to, you know. Oh, I'm on, I'm on I'm on Twitter, just Joseph Lombard at Twitter. Um, where else am I? I guess I'm on Facebook. Um, <laughs> we actually we have we have a study Quran page um, on uh, on Facebook. Oh, perfect. And all of the information, like new things coming out about the study Quran, and you know, there's going to be future editions, like one that has the Arabic. Everybody's been asking for that. Um, and so people can find out more information uh, about that and That's where right. some of the editors are going to be speaking and things like that if they're interested. Where can people co- get a copy right now? You said through HarperCollins. Are, are there? Are, is it available online through Amazon or at your? It, it's a, it's anywhere? available. It's available everywhere. You know, I, I always like to say that people should support you know uh, independent bookstores. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's available at the major ones. Uh, at the major ones as well. Pretty pretty much any any retailer that you go to, uh, you can find it at least for the next week. Well, again, uh, a big thanks to, to Dr. Lombard for, for coming on and discussing the book with us. Yeah, I, th- I think it was great. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually, like I said, I, you know, at, at this point I haven't gotten my copy. I'm, I'm you know, sort of looking forward to uh, checking out when I do get it and delving into it, as I mentioned, on you know, while we were talking with him. Um, I think, you know, it's going to be interesting. I mean, it's going to be interesting. I think there, there, there's always a process that goes in whenever something like this comes out is that, you know, um, there hasn't been a proper peer review. There will be one that occurs once the final product is out. Um, obviously, within the Muslim community, people will begin to check it out and they'll have their own take. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's always sort of interesting how the process goes. So, I, I mean, would, wouldn't the peer review process normally be before before publication i mean yeah i, I guess you know i you, and you're right and i just I, I just don't know well i mean you know the publishing process better than i do but like for example when people endorse the book or write little you know blurbs that you find on the back of the book or commentaries um have they seen the final product or they've only seen excerpts of it I, I believe they've seen the final product or pretty close to it. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, I mean, you know, the, and, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, one can see that there's a, 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 a list of very notable scholars, uh, you know, not to mention the ones who are even involved in the actual editorial, you know, in, in the actual, uh, publication itself, like Dr. Nasser and, Professor Lombard and others, but others who have write, who have written articles. Um, I think we talked about Sheikh Hamza and Dr. Inger Matson. Um, you know, and so yeah, people. Yeah, th- then in that case, people have seen it. Um, I guess I'm just talking about the masses and 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 more than and beyond just the few who have seen it or have written uh, articles in support of it. Um, I think that's going to be something that we're going to begin to see in the next few weeks. So. Um, and as as these things go, and certainly no stra- any anyone who's not a stranger to Muslim discourse <laughs> within the community <laughs> knows within the community knows that there's always going to be differences of opinion and you know different takes and interpretations. And so, certainly the Quran, <laughs> certainly certainly the Quran is no different in terms of uh, that. So. Um- you know, I, it feels like this is a conversation that we want to continue almost, you know, because presumably uh, there, there's yeah. there's more perspectives that we might want to hear from. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to sort of seeing him and engaging him, yeah, uh, in person. I know he's coming out here in January. Uh, I'm told Zaytuna is going to be hosting some sort of a, uh, 
yeah, like a discussion around the book with him. Uh, so that's going to be interesting. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, I always say this with anything, and, and this has sort of been part of the rubric of, or this has always been sort of the understanding of among, among, among Muslim scholars is that any book uh, is going to not be, any book is going to have errors. Any book is going to have uh, its own limitations. And so I think that um, certainly a translation of uh, the holy text, you know, such as the Quran is going to have its limitations it's, you know, probably eventual disagreements and controversies that are going to be, that that are going to surround it. So um, I think people just have to bear that in mind when they approach anything, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the greats, it's often quoted that one of the greats of Muslim tradition, um, Imam Shafi, who one of the schools of jurisprudence is named after, you know, sort of reviewed his book like 40 times and kept finding errors. And at the, after the 40th time, he said, yeah, there's there's no book that's going to be perfect except the book of God. And so who am I? And just, you know, put it out yeah. there for dissemination. I'm I'm very curious. I mean, uh, you know, I, I haven't paid too much attention, but I would imagine that the 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 temperature of the conversation <laughs> is probably heated in certain corners, you know? Yeah, I think, well, and, and I think, that, you know, one of, one of the things that we failed to bring up uh, – with Professor Lombard, but perhaps another time is is the uh, is two things. One is that again, um, and, and we did touch on it a little bit. Anytime you fully embrace something like Sufism, or say we are, you know, we have brought, borrowed extensively from Sufi interpretations of the Quran, you're automatically sort of opening the door for certain. Uh, what's the word? You know. I mean, you're just opening yourself up to criticism because mm-hmm. there are circles within the Muslim community that just simply, just when they hear that word, they have a knee-jerk reaction, right? Sure. sure. And then there's the conversation. And again, I, you know, I, I was, I, I thought of bringing it up, but I was sort of very reluctant as to how to approach it. But uh, as much as I and, and others revere and respect uh, Dr. Sayyid Hussein Nasser, um, there have been throughout sort of, throughout his scholarship, um, I don't want to say accusations, but just people uh, who sort of interpret Dr. Nasser as belonging to this, uh, the, the, the so-called perennial school. Um, and by that is this idea that all religions carry with them universal truths. And sure. so by way of analogy, you know, think of it as like paths to the summit of a mountain, right? Or to the peak of the mountain that eventually, regardless of what path you take, that you'll reach the summit. And so this, uh, that, that perennial school that has it, um, certainly a rich vein in Muslim academia in America, um, but say to say Nasser, like Nasser, Professor Nasser being one of the sort of people who are linked with that school. So I imagine, I can't, I can't imagine that not coming up. Hmm. as well with regards to this um with this translation <laughs> well and i think that that's a good, as good a place as any to sort of uh, tease what i'm sure will be a continuing conversation on this show yeah absolutely i i i'm going to be curious yeah I, i'll be curious to see what the re- you know what if we get any response from the show like in terms of feedback from our listeners and others who get a chance to listen to the interview and uh we'd love your feedback we'd love to hear from you um not just with regards to this episode, but I, we always say this, but uh, I think in particular, uh, for those of you who checked out the uh, translation, the book, uh, yeah, do chime in with your thoughts. Well, and uh, with that, uh, Pervez, where can people find us online? That's right. Send your comments, uh, feedback, uh, thoughts, suggestions to diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can... Uh, Ping us on Facebook, facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. Um, you're obviously downloading us either via Podbean or um, iTunes or Stitcher Radio. Please do re- leave a review where possible. Uh, any bit helps. And uh, we look forward to talking with you in the next few weeks. And with that, on behalf of Pervez Ahmed, my name is Saki Hassan. This is Diffuse Congruence. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>